If you're planning an elk hunt this fall and you just spent two grand on a titanium spork in a tent that's literally the size of a large garbage bag, I'm making this video with you in mind. I guarantee that a better understanding of the seven topics I'm going to cover in this video will improve any backpack elk hunting trip. And they're going to increase the chances of you actually harvesting a bull. Some of this stuff may feel counterintuitive to you. It may even feel a little anti-conventional wisdom. But all I can say is it's based on a real data set over a decade of guidance in the wilderness and helping plan and execute literally hundreds of backpack hunts. What's the goal of hunting elk with a backpack on? The goal is to kill a bull in some of the most heavily elk hunted areas on earth. That's it, that's the goal. We don't need to overcomplicate it. People start to think that if you optimize how far you can get away from the road, your chances of killing a bull go way, way up. This is not the case. Using your flexibility as a backpack hunter to get to spots where pressured elk go that is the key. Not just going as deep into the wilderness as possible. Elk hunting is not a timed marathon race. It's more nuanced. It has more moving parts. The first thing to realize is the further you get from the road in a lot of parts of the West, particularly in Colorado, you're going to run into outfitting pressure. A lot of wilderness areas in Colorado and in other states the real outfitting pressure is going to be in that range from 6 to 12 miles from known trailheads. As a DIY backpack hunter, outfitting pressure is particularly hard to deal with. It's not that necessarily they're better hunters or anything like that. It's that the nature of how they operate makes it challenging for backpack hunters. In these wilderness areas, outfitters tend to be pretty well equipped and their camps have a pretty big footprint and that large footprint and just the action around the camp that affects the immediate region's elk. They've got horses in camp, they've got wood stoves running. So after those outfitters have had those camps in for a couple weeks, they're actually relying on horses a lot of the time to get away from the camp to start their hunts. But as a backpack hunter competing with that, it means long hauls on foot for you before you're getting into elk. And this is after the fact you've already burned a bunch of logistics, time, and energy getting way back into these areas. The next part of this I want to talk about is what I call e-scouting vortexes. Everyone is e-scouting now. Onyx is an awesome resource for folks. Everyone e-scouting tends to focus on how far the trails go in. Few focus on the nuances of the topo lines, the nooks they could bushwhack in. They focus on the trails instead. Let's take Colorado for example. There are areas where you can reasonably get 10 miles from a road with your backpack. And it's actually not that crazy physically hard because the elevation grades up and down are pretty mellow. And there are these well-traveled long distance pack trails all over the wilderness areas. The other thing that becomes very relevant when we e-scout is the elevation elevation of the trailhead we start at. If there's a road that goes way up in elevation and now we can enter the trailhead at a higher elevation to these long distance trails, that's optimal. So the thing is, is everyone is in their house on Onyx in July and August optimizing how far they can get into an area along a trail using the little measuring tools on Onyx and figuring out the furthest distance they can get in. But at the same time, they're figuring out where they can drive up to the highest altitude possible. So everyone thinks they have it figured out. Well, it turns out, all of us are on the same brainwave. I've seen it for years, a spot way far in a wilderness area along a historical pack trail, and that pack trail goes through pristine elk country. It's the first day of the season, and sure enough, you get way back in there, and 10 to 15 other backpack hunters have gotten into the same exact spot with the same exact plan. You've all fallen for the e-scouting vortex, clusters of pressure that are just a result of everybody optimizing the same variables while they e-scout. All right, so how do we find the pockets of country that are gonna hold the elk during hunting seasons if raw distance isn't the answer in these remote areas? I can tell you for a fact, particularly when the weather conditions allow them to do this, elk stay away from those primary trails, just as if those trails were road with a bunch of road hunters on them. I noticed this a ton when I was packing as an outfitter. After the first or second weekend of the hunting seasons, these main trails, I would never see elk tracks on them. I mean, I would literally pack you know, a string of mules for 10, 15 miles. 20 mile round trip and not see a single elk track on the main trail because those elk would just buffer it just like a road and on these same pack trips I would be going up and picking up dead bulls and those bulls might be a thousand yards off the trail a mile off the trail maybe even 500 yards off the trail but they would not be using those primary trails literally not a single track on 15 20 miles of trail so my first piece of advice on this once you have found a wilderness area or big broad remote area that you're gonna back backpack in, 
look at the trail system and find the elevation bands that don't have trails that run through them. So if you've got a trail that runs through the bottom of a drainage, you know, you typically ride along the, the main water source, then 2,000 feet above that, you have a trail on the plateau or the ridge line above the drainage. You need to look at that and consider that you've got 2,000 feet of vertical between the bottom good trail and the top good trail where there's gonna be much less pressure. This is where there's going to be little nooks and benches and little holes. Somewhere in there, there's gonna be very little elk cutting pressure and once those elk get hunted in these wilderness areas, that's where they're gonna show up. Particularly in these wilderness areas that are over hunted, once the season starts, pressure is the number one factor. And that factor obviously plays into what elevation the game's gonna be at. This is even more so in phenomenal habitat where animals are not limited by water or feed. Tons of areas in Colorado in particular are like this. So like I said, focus on the bands of elevation where there's not great access. This almost always means work and bushwhacking with your backpack on. I know areas just like this in the Collegians, the Maroon Bells, the Flat Tops, the Gore Range, where there's a bunch of hunting pressure up high and there's a bunch of hunting pressure down low and there's these little benches and little sections of terrain in between that hold all the elk. In a lot of these areas, we're talking about spots that are just a mile from a trailhead, two miles from a trailhead, and that trailhead might have 10 to 15 trucks at it. So as you look for these spots, also realize that they tend to be unglassable from the heavily used main trail systems, right? Or you have to glass them from a very long distance away with big glass. All right, before I jump onto the next topic, I know there are some experienced backpack hunters that watch this channel. So you guys chime in in the comments. Let people know any other kind of unconventional approaches that have worked for you when we're talking about backpack elk hunting. I know many successful backpack hunters that never travel more than two or three miles on a trail, yet they're still using the advantages they have as a backpack hunter to get success. So if you have an interesting approach to how you backpack hunt, please leave it in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. For years, I've gotten this question a ton from backpack hunters. They want to know about getting help on packing meat out. All right, so my opinion on this one might be a little controversial, but my recommendation on this is if you're backpack hunting for elk in the western states, do not depend on outfitters in the local area or other local help to get elk meat out after the harvest. The exception might be if you have a long window due to meat friendly temperatures. This is not typically in September, maybe later hunts. Or you have an established relationship with an outfitter. The reason I say this is first, there's this issue that some areas just don't have reliable folks that operate in them. That's just a fact in many wilderness areas. The second issue is that for whatever reason, there's a set of variables that come into play that just click. It's kind of like fishing, right? The bite can just be on. That concept is true with elk hunting a lot of the times too. You've killed a bull and it turns out that in the broad area, other people have killed bulls too. It's just a timing thing. All those variables click. So even if you've got something set up with an outfitter for them to pack your meat out, chances are a lot of the times you're gonna harvest a bull at the same time that several of their clients have also. And those clients are going to be priority. So the time's gonna come that you have success, you think, it, you think you have it all planned out and you've got the bull ready to go and you realize that it's sitting in warm temperatures and you think, okay, it's all good. I'm gonna contact these guys that I talked to before and they're gonna get this bull out. Those outfitters and service providers are gonna come back and be like, look, man, I've got two other bulls down. I've got to pack out today and I'm not gonna be able to get to yours for maybe 24 hours, 36 hours. So depending on the temperature, that you're actually facing, that may be the difference from recovering meat and not recovering the meat at all. So whenever you're planning a backpack elk hunt, plan that the bull is coming out on your back. That's the safest bet. Sure, if you pull out getting some help, that's just a bonus. I've got a video up on the channel. It's actually 30 or 40 minutes, and it goes over a bunch of tips and tricks on packing out heavy meat loads on your backpack. Go check it out. I'll stick the link up right here. Myself and my guys have packed out a bunch of elk, and there's a few things you can do that'll help you out a ton physically. Get comfortable planning one-way backpack trips through different elevations. Just subconsciously, you generally hunt a very narrow elevation band above and below where your camp is. And that's just because your brain is telling you over time, like, hey, okay, let's stay at this elevation because every time I go up 
or every time I go down, it's painful because I gotta hike down or I gotta hike back up. So a suggestion I have when backpack hunting is take two vehicles and put one vehicle at the bottom of the mountain and take the other vehicle to the top of the mountain or as high as you can get. Get an understanding of the trail system in your area and where it looks like it's safe to drop down out the drainage to your other vehicle. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to use the higher elevation trail system to get into an area, start hunting it, but then you can slowly migrate down through a bunch of different elevations. And then you can eventually just roll out the bottom into your vehicle that you've got down there at the trailhead. Yes, it does take a little more logistics. And if you're traveling a long ways, it means two vehicles. But implementing this type of system as a backpack hunter, you are going to end up hunting some country that very few people hunt. People are naturally fearful of this. People don't want to get far away logistically from their vehicle. They don't want to get down into some remote road system, have no way to get back up to the original vehicle. So they don't do it. And that leaves a bunch of country unhunted. So coordinate with two vehicles. You can always backtrack to your original vehicle, but you have the ability to just keep going down. And along the way, hunting country that no one else has been hunting. And you don't have to do this in a quick manner. You can do this over a five, seven day period, 10 day period if you want. Also, this circles back to the point I just mentioned. If you've got to pack out meat, I never pack meat uphill if I can avoid it. So having a go out the bottom exit plan is huge if you're packing meat. It makes the trip way, way easier. The only thing I will say here is if you're naive to the area or you haven't done a lot of hunting in the mountains and you haven't spent a lot of time in the mountains, probably need to do these type of circles, you know, dropping out the bottom during the summertime and during scouting trip. The worst thing that can happen is you try to get out the bottom of an area, you get rimmed out, you're in the dark, you've got nowhere to camp. This can be very frustrating and potentially dangerous. But once you've done this a lot, you'll learn how to have plan A, plan B. In a lot of the real intense mountain guiding that I've done, I've come out many times with a pack full of meat and I will always have turnaround points, right? I've got them marked on my map, I've got them marked on Onyx and I go, okay, if I get down this far in elevation and I don't see a clear path through to the bottom, I'm gonna stop. I'm not gonna continue to go down. I'm gonna side hill across to my plan B or plan C because you wanna keep that elevation. One of the worst things you can do when you've got a really heavy pack is just keep dive bombing down. You don't want to do that. You want to have defined turnaround points and have plan B, plan C. Because if you get way down and all of a sudden you've got to climb back up with really heavy pack, it can destroy you mentally. But if you're new to this, just go scout out loops and do it beforehand so you don't have to worry about I have talked to hundreds of hunters over the years who call me when they're planning a backpack hunt and they describe to me the path they're going to take. A lot of times they would be going into the same areas I was outfitting in and they would describe this path that was insane. They're gonna go into this basin, glass for a day, then they're gonna come all the way out. If there's no elk in there, they're gonna go over to this other basin and then they may even come out of there and then they're gonna get in the truck and go across the state to a different wilderness area. These folks are highly discounting the cost of logistics and this cost comes in two forms time and energy. In terms of time, people way underestimate the time it takes to pack up a backpack camp, go all the way out of an area, get to your vehicle, get all your stuff sorted out, get all your stuff repacked, and then go into a new area. It's going to typically take you at least a whole day, if not a day and a half, to get yourself turned around into a new spot when you're backpack hunting. So very few people factor that in. And a lot of times it's worse because you end up staying at a hotel, getting cleaned up, and then going out again. So it could be two or three days even between changing spots. On a six or seven day backpack hunt, depending on your logistics, yes, you can do that once, but when you get into this idea that you're gonna do it two or three times, just based on time alone, it's gonna eat too much of your hunt. So don't plan on doing that. The second big cost is energy. And this is the stuff I really pound on in that video I mentioned, why people quit. You will burn up your mental energy and your mental capacity if you plan to be going in and out of areas and checking a whole bunch of different areas and moving around all the time while while you're backpack hunting. This kind of intangible energy that you're burning up on logistics, that is your highest valued thing while backpack elk hunting. That's your most valuable resource and that's what's gonna get you through your hunts. Your energy and enthusiasm for the hunt. For all you viewers out there who have done these backpack hunts, please comment on this. What's the happy medium for you? Are you able to change complete spots one time on your backpack hunting trips? Do you just assume that you're not changing locations? Give us an idea what works for you. Typically what I found on your typical backpack elk hunt that's five or seven 
days. Generally, you can pull off changing your whole location once. If you're able to backpack in somewhere where, where there's options and you can change camp locations two or three times, but they're only a mile here or a mile there, in those situations, you can change it up maybe two or three times. All right, so the seventh topic I wanna to touch on is that you should be mentally prepared for that urge to quit when it shows up. So many people go out west thinking that they're not a quitter. They don't even address the concept. There's no way I'm gonna quit. I've got so much money tied up in this. I've got so much time involved in this trip. I'm so motivated to do this trip. The idea of quitting, you know, is just, it's just not going to happen. That's the wrong approach for these backpack elk hunts. You need to preemptively address this in your mind before you go on these hunts. I guarantee that 99% of you on your first few backpack elk hunts, several times during the hunt, you are going to want to quit prematurely. Some of you, and this is probably more of the norm, are going to experience this on a daily basis. At least once a day, you are going to have the urge to pull the plug on the trip and call it quits. There's so much variability in these trips in terms of difficulty to find Game, the variability of finding game, you know, all the effort that's gone into it, the physical exertion, the change of diet, the change of sleep pattern. The idea of going home, taking a nice shower, getting cleaned up, cuddling up with your wife in a nice warm bed, that is going to cross your mind and it's going to get you to quit. And again, guys, this is something I want people to comment on because I know most backpack hunters who have spent time backpack hunting will probably have stories on this topic. You guys know how intense this urge to quit can be on these trips. So what I'm getting at here is be preemptive about addressing this. One of the primary things that I do when I'm on a rigorous backpack hunt is I always keep in mind that the hunt can change just based on one single moment. And if I quit that moment that could be right around the next bend in the trail, it could be the next time I lift my binoculars, that moment I'm cutting it off. That's a great way to get through these moments when your body is telling you to quit. Because if you think, hey, this hunt can turn around at any time, even in the last hour of the hunt. If you have that mindset, you can get through a lot of those trials time. All right, so the bonus one, the eighth topic that I wanted to touch on, and this is more a practical piece of advice. We're going to talk about diet and sleep and the idea of testing it out before you go on your first backpack hunt. So my suggestion on both of those, way before your hunt, test them out. Get your sleeping gear out, get your tent, get your sleeping bag, get your pad, and use those for a couple nights. Either go out on a camping trip, take your kids on a camping trip, or if you have to, do it at your home. Sleep on your pad, sleep inside your tent, sleep inside your sleeping bag that you're going to use on that backpack hunt. You absolutely do not want your first nights in that gear to be up on the mountain. I promise you that a lot of you will find things about your sleeping system that are just insurmountable to deal with. You need to find those things beforehand and adjust them before the hunt. Some mummy bags are just too small for certain guys. Some guys get into their backpack tents and they're just too claustrophobic. We're all different and we're all going to have little pet peeves about this system. So make sure you use that system before the trip. An example of this for me personally is some of the nice high-end sleeping pads, these nice inflatable pa pads they have now. They're very comfortable. They're very lightweight. They have crazy high R values, but they're very noisy and I just can't use them. But if I was new to backpack hunting, I would have no idea that that's the case. I wouldn't know that until I was way up in the mountains and that might cost me four or five nights of sleep. That's a major issue on these hunts. So make sure all your sleeping gear and your tent work for you. The same thing with diet. Eat your diet that you're planning to eat on these backpack hunting trips for at least two or three days at home. I know this sounds weird because it means you might be eating mountain house at your home for a couple days, but do that just to see how you feel for a few days. There's probably going to be things that are completely non-appetizing to you that you think you are going to be able to eat for many days. And or there may be things that you actually find that upset your stomach that you had no clue they do. So again, you want to work that out way before you actually end up in the mountains on a backpack elk hunt. All right, guys. So I hope those eight things help you out. Once you've done a bunch of these backpack elk hunting trips, your success is going to have a lot more to do with the conditions and how well you've learned the area and the elk in that area. But these first few trips, the number one factor in this list that I mentioned is the urge to quit. It's tenfold more important than anything else. So please go check out that video. I think you'll get a ton out of it. Good luck out there, guys. I'll catch you next time.